Welcome to our next episode of the Five Moments of Need Performance Matters series. This is Bob Mosier, one of the many co-hosts you'll meet throughout this series. So friends, are you trying to learn more about the five moments of need? Maybe how to design for them, implement for them, measure them, and even sell them as an approach to your enterprise. Well, in the Performance Matters series, we will help you better understand the theory and best practices behind this powerful methodology and offer proven ways to put the five moments of need into practice. Welcome, friends. Bob Mosier here, one of your co-hosts of the Performance Matters podcast. You've heard us so many times, not necessarily seen us. To my left, right, above, or beyond, wherever, whatever kind of view you have in Zoom right now is my dear colleague, Dr. Khan Gafferson, who also has the uh, logo behind him. Khan, you want to say hello? Well, welcome, everyone. It's great to have you with us. And we know, friends, this is a special time, to use that word loosely. Um, and we thank all of you. We are so excited, frankly, about this conversation in the context of the world we live in today. So we are looking forward to our esteemed panelists jumping in here in just a minute. We appreciate you taking time out of your very busy day. We are a little biased. We think workflow learning is really an important thing here. That's why we hosted our first live podcast ever. This will be turned into a podcast when we are done. So welcome, friends. So let's get at this. We are so honored today to have three of my heroes in this business with us. These are remarkable learning leaders. I've known them for a good chunk of my professional life, personal as well. They're dear friends, admire their work and the leaders that they are. And so we'll let them introduce themselves here in just a second and tell a little bit about workflow learning in their industry and their organization and kind of go from there. So friends, thank you so much. Let me start, Doug Holt. And before I do, my friend, I also want to lay out the disclaimer that these friends are volunteering for this. They are not representing their companies. This is not necessarily the view of their organization, gracious enough as industry leaders and pioneers to spend this time with us. So Doug Holt, why don't you start, my friend, introduce yourself, and why don't you give us your perspective of what is, frankly, a very nebulous definition right now. What to you as a learning leader in your company is workflow learning? Well, hello, everybody, and Bob and Khan, thanks for uh, allowing me to today. Uh, again, Doug Holt, my current work is with the Council of Inspectors General in Washington, D.C., the our training academies for the Inspector General workforce. In a prior life, I was chief learning officer for defense intelligence, and I grew up in learning in the higher uh, education world. And so I've had a bit of a full spectrum of different types of environments where I could see how learning was approached and, and have evolved in different ways as I've gone through my career. For me, workflow learning, my first thought is to go to more of a technical definition, but when I step back a little bit, in my mind, it's really actually a mindset and discipline and it's a process and it's a structure that enables performance from a learning perspective. And I think that's important because Somewhere along the line, I think our industry as a whole forgot about that and we turned into just training delivery shops. So to me, that's what it's all about. Brilliant. Perfect. And I love the categories. Thanks, friend. Be back to you in just a bit. Bill Hickey, can you jump in here, my friend, with who you are, your organization, and your viewpoint of workflow learning? Sure. Thanks, Bob. And as, as Doug said, it's really it's good to be with you all. Thank you uh, for inviting and, and uh, it's always always a pleasure. Bill Hickey, I work for Exalta Coding Systems. We are a manufacturer of primarily uh, automotive finishes, industrial coatings, wood coatings, things like that. I've been in and around education since, gosh, uh, 1985, which I think was about the last time my hair was this long, <laughs> uh, from teaching high school to training coordination at a research and development facility to learning design and development here most recently in my career. Workflow learning, and from my perspective, really is how do we develop capability? How do we develop performance efficiencies by providing access to tools, to information, to assets in real time, making things available to folks as they are actually trying to complete a given task, driving away from this sense of I have to learn everything I'm going to learn in a kind of a school environment, although I came from the school environment, moving it more towards I learn in my doing, by doing, but certainly learning in my doing as well. So much different model. Some of us who are more or less classically trained in these sorts of things, this is a, a different way for us to begin to look at things, one that's very refreshing. And then, of course, in these days, as I know we'll be talking about, one that really makes us think and behave differently. Brilliant. Thanks, my friend. And 
last but by no means least, my friend Mark Wagner. You want to jump in here, Mark, with the same? Sure. So uh, Mark Wagner, I work at the Hartford. Um, I'm the vice president of learning for the claims organization. And I uh, actually had that same duty at Progressive Insurance for a very long time. And that's where I, I met Bob many years ago. As far as how I view what workflow learning is and, and does for us, pretty simply, it's laying out content for people so that they can access it in a very easy way in the course of their job every day when they need it. And hopefully if you lay it out right, within two clicks, they can get to anything that can help them complete a task, complete a step, or maybe do a, a deeper dive into learning if they really don't understand something mm -hmm. and help them move forward without much effort, really, making it easy so the workflow seems seamless. Love that. And I love the pivot on both learning and support. I think that's a misunderstanding of the discipline in a lot of ways, you guys, frankly, is that it's either EPSS, right, or performance support or job aids, or, and then there's training. And Mark, I think you outlined it brilliantly that we have learned in our work that if you build this to the robustness with which the methodology and the technology and things, Doug, you mentioned can support, you can cover the gamut. So, Khan, you want to jump in next? Sure. Every time that we perform, we learn, don't we? I mean, performance as we grow and develop in our work, as we are supported in that performance, we are learning, we're developing experience, we're growing in our capacity to perform. And all of you are involved in making sure that that happens and strengthening and helping people learn in the workflow. We're kind of a, cha a real challenging time really for organizations. So the, the real question is, can folks actually do workflow learning now? Can organizations move and should they be moving into workflow learning now with things being what they are? Your thoughts, Doug, you want to start? Sure. So I, yes, absolutely. I think it's something that they should be thinking about and moving into. Generally, it's not the kind of thing where you can just say, I'm going to start and tomorrow we're going to be finished. It's an evolutionary process, incremental in many ways. But I do think you need to start. You need to identify a way and a place to start and to start working towards that. And I think if you're already in it, what I've found where in our current situation is the road is so wide open right now and people are so receptive to trying things a different way that if you're already involved, you can accelerate. And that's what we're trying to do. We've stepped on the gas a bit and people are listening and paying attention like never before. And so I think it's a real opportunity to kind of seize the high ground and transform what we do fundamentally from here on out. That's insightful, Doug. Thank you. Uh, it is accelerating. The organization is much more open to workflow learning and all the forms that we need to bring it. Bill, your thoughts. Yeah, we, we talk evolution, crawl, walk, run, but might these circumstances be presenting an opportunity for a revolution here that, mm -hmm. that much more rapidly we begin to, to look beyond what we always did because what we always did may never happen again. So might it now be time to look for what's triggering this sense of survival mode? I know in, in, in my work, my industry, so many things have shut down that business leaders and individual employees are really feeling very threatened in a variety of different ways. Are there ways for us to look at, at what those survival reaction triggered things are and start to say, you know, here, here's a way we can address through workflow learning some of the things that are causing us the greatest concern. We can take these small elements and say, let's begin to focus on this because if we can accomplish this in the next hour or the next day or the next week, do you see how that is moving us a little bit further along, getting us better prepared for when things open up again? Or if nothing else, creating some sense of stability maybe in the minds and hearts of some folks who really are shaken up by all of this. So, so I really think it's that sense of getting started on things that maybe are of greatest concern for folks where you can be begin to bring them along incrementally. And as a result of that, really have revolutionized what it is we do and how we do it. Thank you. Mark, your thoughts? Well, it's interesting. I think now that everybody is working remotely, 
you can almost make it a business imperative that this is necessary. And what I mean by that is if you're an organization who's used to having people in a hub or an office setting, the question over the cube is gone. <laughs> You can't say, hey, I'm having problems with this. Uh, there's nobody there. So this idea that people can have the workflow at their fingertips is really your first line of defense. I think that the person who is remote now feels like they have what they need to be able to do their job. That's one area. The other one is, is that we're in a mode where we're needing to flex our workforce. Mm. And we see this method giving us the opportunity to much easier let a person learn another role because we need them to bolster that part of the business. And when you have it all laid out for them and maybe teaching them remotely, that becomes your grounding for the learning. So mm. just a couple thoughts. But, you know, I think, I hate to say a crisis can not you know, call you to action, but I, I think that's what we're seeing. You know, I love the thought having the workflow at your fingertips and the capacity to move beyond the work that you're doing to work in other ways within the organization and enabling that through workflow learning. So thank you, Bob. You know, it's been funny, guys, because I've been on, I can't tell you how many of these calls in the last four weeks, well over 40 or 50, honestly of these things. And two trends have emerged that, Mark, you actually nailed really well. But I think it's one we as L&D professionals need to run directly at because it's a place we can step in and help. And I think some of it's flying under the radar. And that is that the workflow is gone. We hear this across the globe. One guy gave an instance where he said, look, I used to go take an hour to drive in and back. I had an opening meeting with my team, spent some time in the coffee room talking with blah, 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 blah. All of those are gone. And so he said, my day, when I got in my home, walked in my office and then did my day, I was done at one o'clock in a person that worked till five or six in the evening, typically. So what is the workflow now for these people? How do we step back and help them define what the new flow of work is? And then Mark, you nailed it perfectly. The misunderstood support infrastructure that existed in the cubicles, that existed in the work is been ripped out from folks that they didn't realize how intuitively they'd learned to become dependent on that. Right. So they are really isolated is a word people I hear people using that I feel I, they're on Zoom meetings all the time. But they, when they, they say when they're doing the work, they feel isolated from not just their peers socialized, which is part of it, but from their network of support and how they got through the day. So, team, let me ask you this question. This still seems very grandiose to folks. It's, it's the, you did a great job of, of, I think, defining conceptually what workflow learning is. But. If I'm sitting out there listening, I'm like, look, how do I get started at this thing? Do I have things that I could use right now? Bill, I'm going to go to you first. You kind of spoke to the idea about, you know, some of the topics you could maybe wrestle. There's a logistic side to this. Do you have any recommendations on how people can actually get started? I like the idea, again, what is triggering the biggest reaction? Where are they feeling most disconnected or trying to define what the new flow is? But talking to them about repeated engagement, one of the things with coworkers in a cubicle environment is you're seeing each other all the time. You might see each other at, at eight in the morning, at 1030, at break, at, at lunch, all those sorts of things. Is it possible for us to begin to look and say, we're going to create a series of repeated engagements hmm. where rather than organizing content in the one hour format or the three hour format, Instead, looking much more at the, uh, we're going to have bursts of information throughout the day. We're going to have bursts of interactions throughout the week. Whatever culturally works for you, that's a mind shift. No, you train me once and, and that's it. Well, this is going to look very differently at this. Is, is there ways for me to engage you repeatedly over the course of what the new workflow is, whether that can be defined in terms of hours or days or weeks? It's creating this new sense of socialization that, yeah, we're going to have this interaction. It used to be around the, the water cooler. Now it's going to be via Zoom or it's going to be on Skype or Microsoft Teams or technology du jour. But it starts to build back in that sense of relationship, the sense of community, the sense of socialization. 
I think the struggle on our side is how do we put quality into those engagements? They're not merely opportunities for us to chat and ask how everybody's doing, although we should include elements of that. But I think it's an opportunity for us, too, to look at, we're going to meet you here, and then we're going to take you one step further, and then we're going to take you a step further from that as we repeatedly engage here. So from a learning leader standpoint, and even from an instructional design standpoint, that's going to change the way I have to look at things. I'm not building the three-day course, and mm. maybe never again, hopefully never again. Sorry, was that out loud? <laughs> But I am instead going to look at this repeated opportunity to engage, to build relationship, to build cohort, pick the word that works in your organization, and then drive that forward that way. Does that resonate? Yeah, yeah. no, it, it does. It's interesting, guys, because there's a new mantra emerging called Zoom fatigue. And it's not Zoom's fault. That's the, it's like Kleenex, right? It's the, so pick the flavor of the month, WebEx, the whole deal. It's like that people rush to this as a technology. I totally get that. But like you say, Bill, the, did the design follow? Did the intentionality follow? Is it stepping in to meet those social needs and, and others? That's the, I think that, I think that's, that's, you know, that's the phase two is I hear people calling it, for instance, that I think we're falling into. Mark, how about you? Yeah, that, that's a tough question. Um, you know, how to start. And maybe it's because I've been doing it so long. I <laughs> <laughs> but if you wanted to do this and do it well, I, I think the first thing you have to do is, Look at your instructional design group who does the traditional learning module and carve out some people that you want to think in terms of workflow. Mm. How can they get good at developing content that's in a workflow, in a performance support format, and then able to figure out all the learning assets you have and how those can hang together in that environment. And to be honest, I think that I feel very good and successful about this because of the people that I've carved out and put into those roles. And as they get better and better at thinking about how do I make this accessible to somebody when they need it and where should it live and how should it be tagged and how should it be searchable, then you get a really powerful team that can help aid the business. And to me, that's the first step. And you usually have those people in your instructional design team who can think like that. And you're just kind of moving their skill set around a little bit and looking at things a little different way. Again, it's a, it's a mindset, right? It's right. not just the technology play. We said that over and over again. Technology, we're going to get that in a bit as we may talk about some examples. And it's at the, it's in there, like LCD projectors in the classroom. But it, it in of itself does not make this. I love the idea about the specialization and helping lift the parts of the team that can support that. Because not all of them can also is another thing that we've sometimes learned. So Definitely. yeah, Doug, how about you with your group and your work? Sure. So this is pretty interesting to me on the, the how you get started, because I had two different experiences. And the, the first experience was at uh, Defense Intelligence, where we were trying to tame a giant bureaucracy. And the approach that we used was to just start a bunch of projects and then see which one hits first and best and then ride that. That worked a little bit. And after I left, it apparently got some legs, which is good. But at the council, what we decided to do is to do it exactly by the book, as if you started from zero and went forward, and with the intent of addressing this across all of our career fields. And so the first thing that we really needed to decide and did decide is that we wanted to be about enabling performance, not training. And so in real life, we are still split. We haven't gotten to everybody yet. But we have started to make the mental shift into it's about performance. Secondly, we took some time to learn about workflow learning, and that took a good bit of time. And one of the challenges that we had with all of this is who do you include and who do you exclude until you have enough momentum to get going. And that was a little bit tough, I think, on the staff side, because there's this little small group doing special stuff off to the side and people want in and they can't get in. And the reason they can't get in is because it's too complicated to have 50 people playing around. You need a core of people who can really get going and start to be good at it. And then the next thing we did, I think, that worked really well is we picked the 
most underserved entity in our organization. And we went to them and said, look, we know you, there's hardly any learning opportunities for you. And what's out there isn't very good and we'll make you a deal. And that deal is if you work with us, if you provide your SMEs and you don't ask a lot of questions, but you just kind of roll with it, we will come out the other side with the most innovative, most modern, most performance oriented learning stuff you've ever seen. And in the pilot group that we work with, that is what has happened and is happening. Yep. Got to crack the code and get the momentum going, right? We talk about buy-in and Con and I have done the pitch. Those of you who know us have seen the train transfer sustained slides, five months of need a thousand times, but in the end, they got to see it. They got to touch it. They got to feel the impact and focusing is a big deal. Good stuff. So the three of you have been at this for a while in your organizations, and we're kind of interested in how this has changed the roles and the responsibilities that your team has moving from traditional learning to workflow learning and to supporting performance. How's that change roles? Mark, let's start with you. Yeah, you know, I think there's usually two things going on in my organization when something's new that they want to introduce. It normally becomes a project and we approach it from that typical learning agile model. But then I have another side of my organization that's continually maintaining content keeping a schedule of when's the next, and we, we refer to our EPSS as KMT, which means knowledge management tool. There's a group of people that have a completely different schedule around maintaining what we've already built and then kicking off with another part of the business, a new KMT. So mm. we almost have two separate plans going on this content design plan very aimed at our performance support there but then also a typical instructional design group working on different types of projects that don't fit into that construct if that makes sense sure doug how have things changed in your organization sure we have kind of an interesting situation because we don't have a large permanent training staff, although we're starting to change that a bit by converting some positions and dedicating them to training type activities. We have detailees that come into us from the line of business who don't have a big training background, and we also don't have instructional designers and that sort of thing. So one of the things that we're looking at is how do we evolve what we call a training program manager role? that the detailees come in and perform into more of a learning producer role to borrow from uh, one of Macy's thoughts. And so we've initiated that by converting a couple of our detailee positions to permanent. And with those permanent positions, we started right out of the gate with, okay, you're a learning producer. Now in real life, they're still doing a lot of traditional training things because it takes a while to convert everything. But as a practical matter, what we said is over the next two or three years, what we want this position to become is sort of a learning ombudsman. And so if that means that the best way to affect performance from a learning standpoint is to set up a podcast or to do like a town square lunch and learn kind of thing or deliver training or set up training or refer people to training or coaching or mentoring or whatever. That's what we want it to be about. And so we're just in the initial stages of that, but it's kind of an intriguing little experiment and we'll see where it goes. The other thing that I've been kicking around that's an interesting question in my mind is, do we want to acquire an instructional designer type person? And I'm mm. in the middle of bubbling on that right now. I haven't landed on anything although I am kind of leaning towards an instructional designer that knows the process and can apply it across all of our learning units in order to go a bit faster. But it would definitely not be a traditional instructional design qualified person. Wonderful. Bill? Some significant change. I mean, much of the training that we deliver 
training versus workflow learning, instructor-led providing uh, skill development for collision centers throughout the United States and Canada. When you, mm. when you wreck your car or you take it to a body shop, we train the painter who's going to refinish your vehicle. That's one part of our business. Many of those businesses have shuttered for now. Some have been viewed, depending on where they are, as non-essential. So the technical instructors who are responsible for all of that suddenly have a lot of time on their hands. And so as these things go, suddenly we're going to take those technical instructors with that same classroom-based presentation that they would have delivered in a face-to-face -face experience. Let's turn them into virtual instructors. That's one of the big challenges we're facing because you're, you're realizing what you can deliver in a virtual mode, how you deliver it, and the entire experience of that is significantly different than that face-to-face -face instructor-led experience. So trying to get over that hurdle of how quickly can we repurpose those technical instructors and turn them into Doug was pointing out, what are the different roles now that are, are available? Do you turn them into instructional designers? Do you turn them into virtual instructor-led trainers? Do you turn them into content development? I mean, what do you turn them into? I think that's one of the biggest issues that we're really struggling with, with how do you do that? How do you remain relevant? Of course, a fear is, well, if you're sitting around doing nothing, why are you still here? Mm -hmm. um, so I think in times like these, you know, in this this sort of turbulence, that sense of how can we look at our entire instructional staff and look at really ramping up their capability across the board? They're not just technical experts. They really do need to take on a greater sense of role and responsibility so that should we ever need to deal with this again, we're much better positioned to have them working efficiently and effectively from the start. And is this an opportunity to say, you know, we are learning, we've got radically different ways now of engaging our customer base, engaging our own employees, even if times and hopefully times will change back to closer to what we used to do. But even in that, has this opened up our eyes to say, we have a lot of different opportunities here that we can engage folks in and we need the talent base to do it. And how might this become developmental for everyone on our instructional staff? Yeah, that whole go virtual thing has been an interesting challenge for most folks too as well. So friends, here's the thing, and we've had some questions about this actually in the chat. You've all done great work well before this thing started. This was not new to you. You didn't flip a coin to become workflow learning specialists or champions just because of the pandemic. You've done remarkable work. Let's let the rubber meet the road here. And if, if you can, I want to actually put a, a little bit of a twist on the question, even as we've talked about it. So if you could go across and share with us an example. How have you done workflow learning? What's an example of it? And has it at all changed how you're seen by the enterprise? Have you as a learning team been seen differently or involved in a business differently because of the success you've had with the products you can share? So Doug, how about, we'll go back to you to start. How about you to get us going? Sure. And actually, I just left a, uh, a session that we're having right now online in order to jump into this. And then we have another one later this afternoon. But I, I would say the situation that we're in right now has actually highlighted the effectiveness of the approach. And we were actually, the training side was actually one of the first groups to get out in front and start being productive, even though, as you know, we're not the most technologically capable organization on the planet, but we still had enough that we had accomplished through our pilot runs of different things to get content out there. And it was received very well. We're suddenly getting a lot of attention for that. And a couple of our products, we have a, what we call a jumpstart class, which is basically the teach the new people how not to drown. And we have something for more experienced personnel. And then something that we're playing with right now is trying to incorporate the storytelling element through mm. podcasts or, or the lunch and learn, recorded lunch and learn kind of things or, or things along those lines. And it's really actually unbelievable. There was a monthly membership meeting of all the IGs and several of them commented on the work that we're doing. And usually we're kind of in the background, but we turned out to be a lot of this meeting, which was really kind of affirming. And one of the members spoke up at one point and said, Doug's been talking to me about performance, not training for a couple of years, and I'm finally getting it. <laughs> and we have um, other people who have never encountered our classes before jumping in online. And the response from the learners is this needs to be the standard. Mm -hmm. And so 
our SMEs are starting to advocate for us, our learners are starting to advocate for us. And I, I don't want to give them false impression that suddenly we won the world, but it's a definite and noticeable change. So we're pretty excited about it. Brilliant. Mark, how about you? How's your work going and how is your department seen? You know, I, I think that the change that has taken place with the business, they look to the electronic performance support as the one place of truth mm. for how you do your job. So if they want to do a process change or if they want to modify something, first question that gets asked is how are we going to modify the performance support, the workflow learning? And mm. It's really even built into the notification of that change. We have an alert that's built into our performance support. Anytime there's a change or an update that's meaningful, people get an alert that says this changed and we very quickly give them an outline of what's changed, why, and here's where it is located in the performance support if you want to look at it for a little extended period of time. So I find that as it's the fabric of now what kind of holds the organization to the standard hmm. and ensures that people have that one place of truth all the time beyond learning initially how to use it and how to do your job right, right in that initial learning experience. Brilliant. So the people aren't running to the LMS per se. No. As opposed to, <laughs> you kind of changed the tip of the sword. Five years ago, our curriculum was valued by hits, consumption, and that was kind of the tool of the trade. You've swapped that out there. Exactly. This is where the content is located. It's been validated. It's what I'm supposed to do. And I don't have to sit through an hour long module to learn that. Brilliant. Brilliant. Bill, you have a very hands-on audience, almost very trade-like. I mean, they're used to a different kind of training, clearly. And so you've had a really fundamental shift and had to bring in some a really different way of looking at things for your company. Yeah, we, we certainly have. And there are folks now gravitating to our customer-focused LMS, our learning campus, as we call it. More people have watched in the last six weeks than did in the, the previous three years sort of, sort of numbers. It's, it's been traumatic. A positive that is, I think, coming out of that is now that we're even a few weeks past that initial burst has been folks now coming to us and saying, hey, here's something that's new. Here's a new process or a new product line. Can you make this look like that? Yeah, we should have watched that three years ago. We didn't get around to it, but we just watched it in the last few weeks. We want ours to look like yours now. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think a positive in this will be that we've gotten exposure to some places that perhaps weren't as visible to the organization as we would have wished some time ago. So that leads us back though now into the challenge of, okay, what are the resources now to start to build all these things this way? What are the principles beyond, yes, you liked it now because you got nothing else to do. How do we start to bring you as subject matter expert or sales leader or technical manager? How do we start to bring you into a design process and mindset, you know, a performance first mindset that says, we're going to do this, but you're part of the solution here. And it's not just a one and done. You're going to be involved in this ongoing. And this becomes not just kind of the next thing to do as a reaction to the circumstances we're in, but really a very different way of doing things going forward. So I think that opportunity is there for us. We'll, we'll be in the usual challenge of talent and budgets and, and all that sort of thing. But I think this has been a chance for us to catch minds and hearts a little bit differently than maybe we had before. You know, I've had the privilege of actually seeing the remarkable work that you're doing. And at the heart of that, of course, is an EPSS, an Embedded Performance Support Solution or System and Infrastructure, if you will. The real question here is, what's the role of that EPSS? your knowledge management system that you have, what's that role? And how has that technology been crucial or critical in this whole process? Let's start with you, Mark. So, you know, I guess the way I would describe it is as you start to think about 
any role in the organization and what you want that role to be able to do. We always think of it in terms of how are we going to support it with that EPSS or in our jargon, the KMT. And it just becomes that easy of a question. Hey, we want to shift people into this role. Do they have the electronic performance support or not? If they don't, nine times out of 10, we're looking at that workflow, doing some uh, rapid workflow analysis, and then adding that role to whatever performance support makes sense. So, you know, it's kind of hard to unravel how it fits in because when everybody's thinking in terms of being supported, they're pointing towards that EPSS, not something else. And we just have that mindset internally. And, and it's a great mindset to have business leaders have. I don't make my job much easier if that's how they think about it. Sometimes it makes it a little harder because everybody's clamoring for their version of it. <laughs> I'm not sure I'm going to get to that because guess what? I'm only supporting 15 people. If I'm supporting, you know, 200 or so, I can make a great business case for that. But the 15 people doing this role, it's a little hard for me to get resources together to build that out. Bill, your thoughts? A lot of them. Boy, an encouraging thing around performance support, the solution that we designed, Kanye, you remember it well. People are now referring to that as sort of their go-to spot. As Mark's saying, it's you don't st start somewhere else and then wind up in KMT. And now folks for us in a little tool we, we called Color Coach, folks were going to Color Coach first. And it was only after, at times, them not finding what they were looking for in Color Coach that we were finding, okay, here's the next things we need to focus on. That tool becoming kind of that go-to resource for folks, I think helps too. You, you know you're turning the corner when that begins to happen. A critical thing with that particular example, the system that this was supporting, the EPSS was built to support a color formula retrieval system or information that folks need to know. We are revising that system. That's moving to next generation. The delight for me was when the design team was coming saying, okay, we're going to build next generation. We want to build it like color coach. You're essentially now modifying a workflow, a system, but you're building it in the image of the performance support that was designed for the earlier version of it. Mm -hmm. So it, it told me that, okay, folks are getting what this can be. You're now designing your next generation tool to essentially be its own performance support solution. So that to me was huge for us. So no five classes? No, <laughs> no. If you're new, start here. <laughs> if you're lost, go over there. It was wonderful. Thank you. Doug? So to me, the EPSS is a Rosetta Stone of sorts. It gives you a common point of reference to work with your stakeholders, different areas of the organization, because the workflow is laid out right there. And so if they want a class, you can say, well, that's very interesting, but let's talk about where you're having issues in your workflow and let's see if we already have that addressed. And if not, you know, let's, let's have a conversation about how we can do that a little bit better. It also allows you to identify how to integrate things that you might have treated separately in a prior occasion. So for example, critical thinking is one of those things that people want a class on and, and we have a class on critical thinking, but where we wanna go with it is look at where in the process you have to particularly apply critical thinking and then provide a model of critical thinking, embed that into the EPSS, and then sort of let people get it through osmosis over time. Or same thing with data literacy. Where does data literacy come into play? And plug that in. And so it's both that and on the measurement end, what it allows us to do is figure out where in the process we want to particularly find out if we're having an effect and then apply measurement strategies to that and get results that would tell us that we're actually impacting the business so that we can then share with our business leaders. And so that, that measurement piece we're just starting on, but it's the presence of the EPSS that allows us to fully actualize the measurement strategy, different from butts and seats and those kinds of traditional measures. Thank you. 
So guys, there's been a question and we want to kind of stay away from promoting any particular product or tool, but can we just go around real quick and just give a build or buy? And what we can do, friends, is a follow on to this when we do post the podcast, we can post some references of third party tools that have been used. But can we just say real quickly, is it an internal product or did you use like a SharePoint kind of thing or did you go outside for third party? Mark, what about you for your KMT? Yeah, so after really looking at all the alternatives, we are highly manipulating SharePoint. And, and again, some of these people who do the content design, I don't even understand how they get SharePoint to look the way they do. <laughs> uh, even our internal SharePoint experts say, how the heck did you do that? So they've just become very good at it. They don't use any programming for the most part. It's all manipulation through the vanilla version of SharePoint. And I'll tell you this, we're moving towards the Office 365 mm -hmm. with the upgrade to SharePoint. Our enterprise IT organization has put us at the top of the list wow. to try our stuff in it because they say your content is designed so pristinely. We want to see how the new environment works with it. So that was a real boon for us to be the first on the, uh, the ladder there. Brilliant. Bill, how about you? We've gone from external solutions when we first started to then bringing that solution in-house. The, the one I had mentioned previously started externally and then became an in-house development tool. So that's good in that the folks who are programming it are now also building it in terms of an NEPSS mindset. And there is a second project we are looking at now that We've been looking at a, an Ask Delphi solution as a possible means of better addressing what those needs might be. The folks who are working on the first solution, that's all they do. It's there. Everything they will use is, is theirs. The next project, Ask Delphi, has got some very intriguing things for us. So we'll be taking a very close look at that. The SharePoint solutions, too, because it is so widely used now in our organization, mm -hmm. our concerns there are that are we turning SharePoint into what we used to turn in our Lotus Notes databases in and how might we get control over what really should be a very powerful tool that we abuse. I mean, it's like PowerPoint. We, it's a fine tool. Why did you abuse it so? So we're looking at a variety of different solutions. The danger there always is, of course, the shiny object syndrome of do you go yeah. grab something because it looked really cool yeah. versus, okay, what performance are we trying to achieve here? What are people using? How do they use it? How do we drive that solution closer to that which they're actually using? And I think that would be always be the, the question I'd be asking if the folks are trying to figure out which one, well, which one fits your solution, be okay with that and go from there. Pivot on performance and embeddedness. Doug, how about you finish that part? And also, I want you to kind of transition us into our next question. So build or buy, but anything new in a company is hard. Any new mindset, and it gets hard. How have you persevered in your efforts, Doug? We're trying to turn an ocean liner around in many organizations, and now with everything heightened, even though I agree with the willingness to try new, there's still the reality of the devil you know. We've taught them to ask for training, blah, 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 blah. So tool and then perseverance. How do you stay at this? So tool, uh, we're, we have a temporary licensing solution right now uh, during our pilot phase, but we are going to buy and kind of like Bill, I think I want to have a backup plan in the form of some kind of a build over time so that if something happens with the main EPSS for whatever reason that we're not caught short. And the reason for that is this is such a heavy investment of time, energy, and effort to get it right. We want to have a backup plan. And then the perseverance is an interesting one for me in particular, because I can't tell you how many times I said, oh, I'm so lost right now and I've got no idea what to do and, and none of the pieces are coming together. And then actually to cut to fast forward, they all do. And you have those bolts of, oh my gosh, this is going to work, <laughs> you know? And so that part helps those, those bolts of clarity help, but more so, I think it's really what we've talked about on our team is the idea that once you see it, you can't unsee it. What I mean by that is once you see the workflow learning process, it reveals all of the things that really are in my mind, malpractice about the way our industry has evolved. And that bothers you. Once you see that, that really bothers you or bothers me. And so every time I was ready to just 
kind of throw in the towel and say, oh my gosh, that would come into my mind and it would just spur me forward because I just could not live with that. You know, when Con first told me the five moments, you guys, and I saw my first rapid workflow analysis, our debuting, now this was a long time ago. I just remember lying in bed as an ID that night, which I was a rank and file ID going, how can I forget this? I don't know how to do it, frankly, yet. And I have some questions. I have a ton because my DNA is my DNA at the time. But this nagging thing, Doug, now that I know this, how do I, as a L&D professional, not somehow figure out how to do this? And Bill, I saw you nodding your head as well. What's your experience been around the, the sticking with it? Yeah, that same sense of, you know, sort of the classic instructional design background and training and then coming across this very different design methodology that started to answer the nagging question of performance. You could design for knowledge, you could design so folks would pass the test and maybe a quick performance type of quick assessment, but how do you create that sustaining capability over time? And that's kept you awake at night. You couldn't figure out how to do that. And then coming across the the five moments, having that sense of, wait a minute, this starts to pull together those things that had been missing. You can't unsee it. <laughs> Once you've hit it, it drives you crazy. We're throwing out so many webinars right at the minute, some of which we're responsible for, many of which we're not. You'll see some of the ones we're not responsible for, and you just think, I, you showed me 60 slides, but you didn't tell me what to do until slide 60. What did I just watch for the last hour? So it affects the way you look at everything. It certainly does. And, and Mark, I know you were brought there, candidly, my friend, because of what you would bring. I know your journey there from your other organization to here. And, and it's one thing to be hired to, to run and institute the change, but it's a whole other thing to turn an ocean liner around, as I often say, around this DNA of training. Right. right? What's, what's your journey been in persevering? And because you've been a true change agent in that organization. What you speak about now was not an, an overnight. Yeah. So the way I would put it is I really did a lot of effort to tell people that what does performance-based learning mean? Definitely lots of let's stand up in front of people and talk about performance-based learning and how we're going to approach things very differently from what they were used to. And once I got buy-in to that and pretty much showing them that their content was such a mess, and they knew that. One of the reasons I came there was to Their content was all over the place. It didn't make a lot of sense. Way too many cooks in the kitchen. Once they pretty much figured out, let's get our content in order. Let's get it so that people can use it the right way. And then people are going to learn from that workflow. And one of the things I still do today is I burn a lot of PowerPoints. If I find someone trying to start a learning activity with let's start with the powerpoint i say why you know we have performance support let's figure out how it fits in and then we can build learning activities around Mm -hmm. that performance support not let's figure out how to put it into 50 slides we do a lot of powerpoint burning parties You know, starting with apply first, right? It's such a fundamental shift. It's funny because, you know, when I do a lot of our workshops or we orient people in like a conference, I love to just show EPSS right out of the shoot, whether it's theirs or not, just show them. And I say, look, you guys, just put your L&D head on for a second. If you had this first, if you had this first, how would you build training around that? Or would you ignore it and, and make PowerPoints? Which is that fundamental pivot on when you have a tool that is in the workflow and speaks directly to apply and then fall back on how training might enable, support, or frankly, get out of the way of that Mm -hmm. is a real fundamental shift in the whole thing. Well, Mark, what you just shared is such an important insight that we take and make resources available, and then we figure out how to wrap the learning, as Bob says, around that. We've been watching the last three months as organizations have gone into triage mode moving all of their stuff virtual, taking traditional learning and trying to make it virtual and and make it work. And we know what workflow learning can do in this journey of enabling effective performance on the job and bringing order and strength. So we'd like to know, because you three have been doing this, we think it would be helpful to ask you to give some advice to meet this really challenging time They've done the virtual thing and they've moved all of that, but now what? 
let's start with you, Bill, and then we'll go to Doug, and then we'll end with you, Mark. Sure. So I think the best way to start is to connect yourself to the business objectives. What is the business looking to achieve here? And how can I begin to align all of my efforts with things that are driving what senior business leaders would say are the critical goals of the organization? Because once you're connected to those, you can begin to say, all right, well, then what assets, what tools, what call it training? What is it that I can align with those business objectives? And then what does success look like? Because as soon as I'm aligned with performance, as soon as I'm aligned with business objectives, as soon as I'm aligned with what is making us successful, whether times are good or times are bad, suddenly I'm invaluable to the organization. So if I can at least start that conversation, and leader can be defined in a variety of ways, from the CEO to a shift manager. But if I can begin to connect myself to what is going to make this activity, this next hour, this next week, this next month successful, if I can connect it to that, that to me was the biggest start. Because as soon as you begin to chip away at that and start to show that alignment with performance, uh, lots of other things suddenly become possible for you. Connect to performance first, connect that performance to successful business objectives. Thank you. Doug? Sure. So we're embracing the idea of minimal viable product rapidly deployed in areas that our workforce is concerned about. So short little iPhone videos, we're pursuing those, the lunch and learn ideas and that sort of thing. And then uh, where we have training available, we're providing that or referring folks to other things that aren't ours, but which might meet their needs. Thank you. Mark? So usually when I'm trying to get people to be able to change roles, I'm more worried about something like a flood or a hurricane and we're throwing supplemental resources at it. Well, guess what we're throwing resources at today? People who need to take leave, managing people's disability. So I've been asked to take many people who have never done that before and get good at it and be able to meet that need. And because we were able to put a little COVID icon, you know, on our performance support to give them all the changes that are happening every day, being able to say, we can do this in two or three days with a group of people because we'll teach them from the performance support has really been able to move people into roles very smoothly and very quickly and remotely. So. It really has been something we've counted on to help us get through this crisis. And I don't think we would have been able to do it without performance-based approaches. Thank you. Bob? Yeah, friends. I mean, my gosh, people are struggling with performance like never before, aren't they? I mean, it's just remarkable. And, and your leadership, your willingness to take an hour to share your experience and availability to, to share what's going on in your organizations is really inspiring for us. So friends, thank you so much for that. Those listening, be safe, be well. Let's help our organizations get out of this and let's come out of it in a very different and remarkable way. Let's not forget the lessons learned or I think we lose an opportunity. Thanks friends, appreciate your help. Be safe, be well. Thanks. Thank, Thank you. you. Well, that's it for this episode of the Five Moments of Need Performance Matters series. We look forward to future conversations around how to best put the five moments of need into practice. We welcome your feedback and can be reached on Twitter using my Twitter handle, at B-M-O-S-H, as well as our Five Moments of Need website, which is www.the5momentsofneed.com. We hope you're finding these helpful and we'll subscribe to future episodes. Have a great day, friends.